coming up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. And I think salespeople are so caught up with the word relationship that they're trying to build all this rapport with somebody over the phone or in their quick engagement, they don't realize they're destroying credibility because they're wasting somebody's time. And I think sometimes salespeople misconstrue really good people skills or good manners for somebody being interested in you. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Salesman Podcast, the world's most downloaded B2B sales show. If you haven't already, make sure to click subscribe. And on this episode of the show, we have Lance Tyson of Tyson Group. What we're getting into is prospecting and spiderwebbing, this concept that Lance has come up with. And it is amazing. It's the quickest way that I know to build credibility within a large account. It's the quickest way to get in front of people that are difficult to get in front of. And with all that said, let's jump right into the conversation. So a fascinating topic today. We're going to dive into spider webbing with prospecting. So let's start at the very beginning. There's probably a spider's web or a spider pun I could have used there, but we'll start at the very beginning of all this. Lance, what the heck is spider webbing and how does it relate to B2B prospecting? Well, we get that we get the question a lot, especially in the training that we do. Um, for uh, from about 2010 to early 2018, we owned a company called Prospects, PRS. PX and uh, what had happened, it, it, it organically grew out of a. Um, we had owned a training company and part. We did a lot of training with uh, for Dale Carnegie training. Um, if you're part of it, we owned several of their franchises. And when we divested out of Dale Carnegie training, we actually kept our inside sales team. And then training companies and business consulting companies, insurance companies, tech companies start to hire our inside sales team to set appointments. So we kind of became this boutique call center that worked with more complex sales. And so what our job was, and it was, a, it was a tough job where we had to go clearly understand a company's value proposition, their offering, their marketplace, what their customers were about. And then we were sanctioned with going to find the data, take their data that they had, that they would prospect with, and then part of our contract with, was to buy data, and everybody we did business with um, said they had a good database. And what we found is what we thought was a good database and what they thought was a good database were two different things. And then our job, what we got paid to do as part of our consulting, was to win appointments for them. And so as we went from business to business, everybody had an ideal client or an ideal appointment who they wanted. And they, and then as we would dig deeper and pull back the layers, we'd found out that they had like a B appointment that would be okay, somebody who could influence the deal, mm -hmm. and then a C appointment. And so we part of our part of our compensation was appointments one. So we had a very young staff, and we hired young. We taught them how to sell because part of our business was a training business. So we would we would really say, all right, most of the organizations we're doing business with, and probably a lot of people listening to your podcast know that they have an ideal target, but they probably have influencers too in that org chart that would uh, would be really important. So what we started to do is look for level one, level two, level three decision makers, like if it were a manufacturer, maybe maybe it could have been a maintenance manager, somebody who would affect or use use the system or process. Maybe there's a plant manager, maybe there's a VP of ops. So we would spider web our approach. So we would literally send out correspondence and then we would call each decision maker. As we started to learn and we would validate, it usually took about six to eight touches to win contact, right? So like any good salesperson knows, your um, your ability to um, seem credible, your ability to build rapport, connect with people is important. So then we started to determine and really think about this hard, that it wasn't just how we were describing the business our customers were in, but it was also acting like we knew something about the organization we we're calling on. So we would mention the other people we we're calling in. So we, we'd create this web of credibility where we would send a piece of information out. We would follow up with phone call. As we got deeper into messages, we would mention the other people we were calling. And over time, we established some credibility because it sounded like we knew we were talking about. And the key to all this learning, this investment we were making, the buyer 
thought we were part of the organization we were representing. So we never felt like a call center. We it felt more like we were an SDR for that company. We had the same email addresses. We would require that stuff. So the spider webbing was really built to increase odds of contact because we knew winning six to eight contacts would ultimately yield one appointment. That is, I've never heard anyone put it quite like that, Lance, but that's essentially what I would do in medical device sales. So the surgeon would be the one that that are, that are A or level one contact that everyone wants to be in front of. But if I couldn't get in front of the surgeon, I'd spend time with the theatre manager, I'd spend time with the finance team, the procurement team. And by the time it got to an RFP or um, you know a, a tender process as we'd have in the, here in the UK, I was so intertwined in it. I was helping the finance team write the tender process to write the uh, RFP. So I've never heard it called spider webbing before, though I've never heard it I've never heard my mess of a process outlined in a succinct way. Is this something that is uh, is this something that works in specific industries or after a certain deal size, or is this something that all B two B salespeople should be doing? Well, I mean, I would think most B two B sellers probably deal with influencers, champions, and buyers. And I would say as you get more complex B two B, right? You, you could probably factor in, you have a financial buyer, you have an executive buyer, sometimes they're both the same person, you probably have a user buyer, somebody has to implement it, and then uh, probably somebody that's more of a technical buyer. So for instance, in the US, um, you, you hear a lot of complaining about the healthcare system, right? And healthcare insurance um, is provided by all kinds of different insurance carriers. So for instance, in the U.S., I have I uh, we get our health care through or insurance through Anthem, and there's it's a Blue Shield, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and but a broker represents Anthem, but they sell the broker sells to a company like me, so I'm a small to mid sized company, Tyson Group, where we have a VP of Finance, we have who also handles our HR. So if that broker were calling on us, they would go after, I would be a target, but the VP of finance who handles HR is probably target. As you get a bigger company, you have other influencers. Now, if you think about the concept of a spider web, a spider web is built with these rounds of, um, or layers of stickiness that get to the center and the spider sits at the center of strike. Now, obviously, the spider, once one is close to the middle of the, the spider row as possible, but you might get other stickiness outside that. I don't mean to use my hands. I, I'm a talker with my hands. But as you can imagine, the, the C level or A prospects are worth more, right? So what you're always trying to do is trying to get closer to the center of the spider web. However, you may have to go through several doors. Why? Um, because in a complex sale, it could be timing, right? They say timing is everything. Two, like you said, it may you may need influencers to get to an RFP and R, RFQ, and it might take some credibility this way. A lot of times, if you are going to... We, we do a lot of sales training, and we're nationally recognized in the U.S. As, as by selling power as being a top 20 sales training firm. And when we go into complex areas like a like b2b settings we we believe firmly that you'll make a sale or like you would in the uk you'll influence an rfp in some cases by having a certain level level of rapport right so you may have to and rapport yields influence i don't use the word relationship a lot because i think in sales we can we don't do relationship but we can build rapport with people rapport is actionable um, we believe that credibility is really important. What does credibility yield? It yields trust. And then we got to demonstrate a level of understanding of our client. So by attacking the org chart or the spider web, it allows for all three of those things to happen. So I want to get into where to start and we'll get practical about this, hopefully give the audience sales nation a checklist of where to go. But just to flip this on its head slightly, Lance, is there anyone that we should not be speaking to within an organization? Is there any part, uh, whether it's a, a persona, whether it's uh, someone who's on the competitor's payroll somehow? Is How do we define the peoples that we just should never be speaking to if they exist? Well, sometimes that's hard to know, right? So 
we can make a hell of a lot of assumptions, you know, by studying data. Um, but sometimes you're not going to know that until you actually, because, you know, marketing these days allows for a level one assessment, right? We can understand the industry. We can understand the, um, we can understand the, the business itself by what we see. Um, but sometimes you wouldn't even pick that stuff up. So you got to take a certain amount of assumptions. So yeah, there could be like, for instance, um, in, um, if you took a, say you took a tech firm, for instance, and, and it's a little bigger than a startup, and you have some folks that um, were very much involved with, say it was a SaaS company, right? And you, you start calling on the chief technical officer, there's a very good chance that, and you're trying to sell software to a chief technical officer, you, you might get scrutinized a little bit. Right. If you were calling on human resources who have to apply insurance or actually facilitate the insurance, that might be the kiss of death a little bit, because sometimes it's hard to get people to change. But that doesn't mean on the other side of that, they couldn't be able to influence that. We wouldn't know that until we start to call in the organization. I, I, I Let's flip it over on its head again, though. I think a lot of times um, salespeople get so driven and become so kind of alpha that they, oh, I'm only going to call them the C level, the level one person. Well, I think sometimes if you only do that and then go after the other people, right, mm -hmm. I think that could hurt you also. So we actually advise that you go after everybody at once. There used to be, um, there was a book um, that was called The Power to Get In. Um, it was written in the 90s, I think, and, and uh, I think the author was Perinello or something. And this was before there was a lot of um, a lot of emailing going on. So he used to. And by the way, this is I'm going to quote the book. Uh, he used to have a concept called the letter bomb. Now, let's uh, that's, that's <laughs> this episode's immediately been flagged on YouTube now as a uh, inappropriate I, content. Was, uh, I'm not talking about any, anything. <laughs> but what he used to do, what he used to call this concept is when. You would send letters out at the bottom of a formal letter. And I think this is in the UK. You would CC everybody. Um, there is a thought with this uh, concept that you would literally CC everybody also. That like you would maybe on a first outbound, you would you would literally uh, let everybody, the level one, level two, level three, let them know that you are copying them all on it too. There, there is some thought to that and there's an odds play to that a little bit, mm -hmm. right? So that's, um, that's, that's very, it's a way you could go about it. But what I would recommend is a salesperson not just go after one person at a time. The theory of the spider web is you go after everybody at once, right? So because you want to use that ability to drop somebody's name later and you're, because you're, look, you're not going to get anybody on a first call, the odds of that happening are really low. So you want better odds. The odds are if I can drop your name as a decision maker, I'm calling on in somebody else that allows me for some talking points. Sure. That's the theory. So if we were to map this out and there'd be some kind of software product that would do it, it'd be every uh, level one or a person adds 10% probability, every level C or 3% adds 4% probability. And we can, we can map it out and scale it up. And I don't know, are there any software tools? I know uh, BoxStep is a tool that allows you to map accounts. Is there any way to, oh, maybe not software, but you know, visually um, align all this together? I'm, I'm a visual thinker, so it helps no, me to see and diagrams been, and that side of things. I agree. I'm a visual thinker. I was just, uh, I, I always tell our social media person when we're promoting a webinar or something, like build a picture of, me, of it first for me so I can see what we're doing and then I can build all the content behind it so I'm very visual. A very outcome based first. So, um, um, I think you know, on some softwares, some of your marketing softwares, you can build hierarchies out and kind of attack the hierarchies that way. Um, what we do when we're doing consulting, though, we'll actually we do exactly what you said. We'll weight weight each one. Each one's worth more weight. But there's also weight that, like for instance, if you go after a level one person and they knock you out early, mm -hmm. the recovery from there is vast also. So in some cases, as we're breaking down industries, 
we'll go we'll go into an organization and say, well, how you know at, at the last hundred appointments you got, how many were with the C level? And they'll say, well, less than ten percent. Now, is that more because you don't go after them, or because they're harder to get? So we actually kind of peel back the onion again and say, are they harder to get, or do you not go after them? Well, a lot of times we'll find out, well, they went after them, right? They might have had the wrong messaging and things like that. So going through a middle door sometimes doesn't hurt you. Because you got to, if you flip it over again on the side and just using your words, most of the time in a complex B2B sale, you're selling to three to four decision makers anyway. And depending on what the environment is business-wise, you may be adding more people on it. So you're actually selling to a committee anyway, especially if it's a capital sale. So you might as well go after the committee also. That makes total sense. Okay, so Lance, without getting too far into the weeds here, because this is a a whole series of podcasts uh, in itself, right? You mentioned buying data. You mentioned good databases. What data do we need to have as individual salespeople, as individual contributors, to be able to make some of these uh, assumptions, because it seems like we're using the scientific method here, right, of making a hypothesis and refining it as we go along through the the selling process, and we, we're uncovering, well, they're important, but they're not on an org chart, and they're a consultant, so we need to pull them in and finance, and what data do we need to have to be able to start this process? Or is it just a phone call to someone who picks up and we ask them some questions? Well, well, I think you got a couple of ways to look at this. Um, I, I, I don't look at it as more scientific day, data as I look at it as odds. So I think about a casino and I look at my odds when I go to a casino of a, um, when you play the, when you play uh, slot machines, your odds are really lower. The odds are in the house favor. So I, I look though what my next best odds are. And that's probably poker and blackjack, right? Then it's roulette and then it's craps. I think I think if you're spider webbing, the odds are going after at least three people, you're playing a more of a roulette craps game, right, than anything else. That makes sense. And does this then, everyone knows who listens to the show regularly, I have uh, an issue with the current sales marketplace, depends on deal size, depends on industry, but there's a lot of push just to send more spam emails with a tiny bit of customization or more, do more cold calling as opposed to have a more refined approach and go for bigger deal sizes. This clearly fits in the size of, in the, the realm of bigger deal sizes, more sophisticated selling, pro, maybe not more sophisticated selling process, but a actual selling process rather than just spam. Is that the way that moving forward as we, we go through this, uh, uh, you know, pullback in, in the economy, is that what we need to be doing to get deals done versus just using software, tools, random nonsense hacks to try and get more small deals done? I think looking at your podcast and looking at who watches this, you got to make a decision. Were you hired to market or were you hired to sell? I think, I think that's number one. And, and if, if your job was hired to sell, um, most people that you do any kind of written correspondence outreach to, Odds have it that less than 5% are really going to read what you wrote. They're going to just recognize whether they sent them something or not. So these organizations and these salespeople that we coach, at least, they're spending all kinds of time trying to craft the perfect message. Chances are it's not going to be read. Chances are it's, it's, they're going to recognize that you call, right? So I think, I think that's number one. I think, too, in this changing economy, though, um, and this is – you're going to get information that you can read online, right? Now, I, I'm going to share some data stats with you that are come from many different places. The U.S. Post Office says that 1% of all data changes every week. That's the U.S. Post Office, right? The um, Mark Benioff at Salesforce la- or uh, Dreamforce last year said 30% of all data goes bad after a year, okay? Um, when we sold data, right, um, we, would, we would look at what a data source had and what we had, and if any of those two ranges are right, it's mixing bad gas. So as a salesperson, I would not over-trust data. 
I'll make it more, I'll, I'll just use an analogy with you. About a year ago, it was about a year and a half ago, we were having a big kind of happy hour with uh, our inside team. And my manager at the time came up to me, her name's Hannah. She showed me her phone and she showed me LinkedIn, a LinkedIn post. And she goes, um, do you recognize this name? And I go, yeah, I do. I go, is that that Pete? Pete, the guy who used to work for us? And she said, yeah. I said, Pittsburgh Pete. I remember Pittsburgh <laughs> Pete. And she goes, keep reading. And the name of our company at that time or the call center we owned was called Prospects. And um, it said in his, his profile in LinkedIn that he was named employee of the year for Prospects. And I said to Hannah, I go, do we give employee of the year? Do we have that? And she goes, no. I go, oh. And she, I said, don't we have like a hustle award or something? She goes, yeah, we give a hard hat at. out. I said, did he win the hard hat? She goes, he never won the hard hat. I said, didn't we let him go? And she said, yeah. I said, oh. So then I sent him a LinkedIn message. I said, Pete, I hope all's well. I noticed that you won our employee of the year last year. I, I'm sorry I missed the ceremony. And then I said, P.S., you may want to represent yourself better. Mm. I would just say as a salesperson, I wouldn't trust data as much as I wouldn't trust news, certain news sources, as much as I wouldn't trust everything that's written on the internet is true. I think your job is to vet the data, to confirm or deny the data. And that's going to require you in many cases to make an outbound effort. I think the salespeople that overtrust that, I'll give you one other example. Um, I, you guys have you guys have ice hockey in the UK. You have a good like minor league over there. So maybe some people listen that much ice hockey. So um, a friend of mine was um, the president, a customer of ours, the president of the Cleveland Cavaliers basketball team. Mm -hmm. He was named over two years ago president of the Las Vegas Golden Knights, which is a uh, U.S. National Hockey League team. Okay. For over nine months, he did not change his LinkedIn profile from president of the Cavaliers to president of the NHL Las Vegas Knights. Now, if you are prospecting a pro sports business at that time, you would be going after two separate presidents of business operations. Now, am I calling him out? No, I'm just saying I don't necessarily trust all data that's out there. I think you got to be careful in many industries, many. So that's important. This might be, a, again, a completely different podcast, but is there any way that we can learn to, um, or, or books or tools or things that we should be doing to be able to disdain news sources, to be able to think more rationally about this kind of thing and to, you know, I don't want to get into politics, but you, you mentioned different news sources and, that, and it's more, much more prevalent in the US than it is in the UK. Um, with, with the the, the, the politicization of, I don't think that's a real word, but politics getting wrapped up into I everything, right? That. <laughs> <laughs> is there a way or any way to, or anything you can recommend to be a clearer thinker, to be able to make your own judgment on things? No, I think I think that's such a great question, and and I I I, I don't like getting in political conversations. I just think when you're talking information that you must have as a salesperson, there's so much information out there, it actually almost slows you down. So what I what we teach and what we consult to, and even when we enter a call center. We would look for the minimum absolute criteria we, we, we need it. Because we find a lot of times when we consult these organizations to pile on all the data. So what I the methodology that I recommend is what's the absolute information you will need to make a sale? And then how much pre-approach will that include? And what's what's what are the considerations that you'll need that are nice to have information? but not necessarily need to have. So, you know, that, that absolutes could be competitors, that absolutes could be um, how they bought in the past, those absolutes could be decision makers, um, it could be, in some cases, financial positioning of a company. So they're all, they're all things, but, but I, would, I would make sure that I'm culling down the absolutes, not piling on. 
and disdaining from absolute criteria to, to desirables or considerations. Got I think it. that's the scientific methodology that I would that I would adhere to. And I would say most of the clients that we have, or anytime we get in a situation like that, they most of the time don't know the difference. <laughs> they have piled on everything is an absolute, and it's not. And, so and I guess there's a, another layer here, Lance, as well of you've got data on the account. And then you've got people's opinions on the data within the account as well, right? Of they, the company might be heading one direction corporately, and you're using that as your part of your presentation pitch or, or conversation starter. But then you deal with someone who's on the inner side, someone who's on the the C suite, and there's politics going on. There's other things, so you don't really know any of this stuff for sure until you speak to someone, right? Right, and 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 that that's kind of the issue. If you, I'll give you a real basic example. A lot of our clients um, use a, use CRMs, and a lot of the information that's embedded in the CRM is opinions of people maybe that have called on the account before and things like that. And, and I, I, we're always on sales performers to maybe not trust everything that's there. Don't trust everything you read. Your job is to vet, and the best way to vet is like it's, it's almost like running little tests where um, – have you have you even made an outbound call to find out how difficult it is to talk to anybody there? Right. Have you have you called up the organization and just like say you were going after a C-level decision maker? Typically, you know, is the is the gatekeeper technology or do you get somebody that answers the phone? And then do you have a double layer gatekeeper? And I know this happens in the UK all the time. You might have somebody that answers a phone, but then you might have their personal assistant. Do you know how many layers deep you are there? A lot of work, a lot of salespeople haven't even considered the barriers to actually talk to somebody, right? Like there are so many scenarios where I watch salespeople that have to deal with human gatekeepers that don't even ask questions like, hey, what's the best time to get a hold of Will? Do you do you um, do you work on Will's schedule? Do you um, do you schedule for him? Could you help me out? There's a they're so worried about talking to Will, they haven't even thought of the hurdles or the gauntlet they'll have to run to get to Will. And they're and, and we know this to be true in most cases worldwide that the amount of work it creates to get to the conversation is some of the most daunting work. That's why, um, and I and I. You know, I wrote a book, um, and I'm not here to sell my book, but if you do, it's called Selling's in a Way Game. And in my book, I actually use an example where a marketing automation company was uh, trying to win an appointment with me. And really good. So it was actually a person that worked uh, for uh, Marketo, and they went and looked at one of my blogs, and they quoted my blog, referenced my blog in a LinkedIn inbox. And I looked at and, my, and I looked at and I go, well, flattery will get you everywhere. So then the person followed up with a phone call and email. And, and I, of course, I rewarded the appointment. And then so the salesperson opened up like they should have and used a, a sales starter and attention getter where they had said, you know, um, uh, cold calling's dead. And I listened to her out and she was she was pretty good. She was articulate. And I said, you know. I think you're paid to tell me uh, that cold calling is dead. Mm-hmm. It's in your best interest. And she goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, you cited a lot of things. I don't, I don't agree with you. And she cited a, more, a couple more sources. And I said, okay, just out of curiosity, if, if cold calling is dead, why didn't you just use your software to get in touch with me? She goes, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you didn't use your software. Your software didn't quote my blog. Your software didn't call me twice. Your first email may have have that was your first outreach that might have been generated from your software. So I don't I don't concur with your present your premise. I think your premise is off. I think you're paid to say that. It doesn't mean I'm not interested. But I think what's happened a lot of times with with salespeople and sales leaders, they're looking for the fastest easiest way to win an appointment. And unfortunately, as the world changes, that's not, not, it might be partly automated, but a lot of it's still the legwork that a salesperson does. I've yet to see a pharmaceutical rep win appointments via technology. They usually have to show up in the doctor's office to either bribe, 
cajole <laughs> whatever it takes the the folks in the office to get to see the doc, right? I think that's I think that's true at some level. So that's and I'm not saying in all cases either. If you're listening, I, I just seem to run into more cases than not that that it is true that the salesperson or an SDR or a sales development rep is required to to kind of get after it. So is this because you, you? I wanted to ask this question. You've you've led me there perfectly, Lance. Is this because salespeople are as everyone is inherently lazy, or is it because perhaps salespeople just don't have, and myself included, I'm, I'm wrapping myself in with the audience here, the business acumen to have these higher level business discussions as opposed to here's my pitch and product and I'm going to throw it at you. You know, it's kind of we do a lot of assessments and uh, we do skill based assessments. And, and we also assess, and, and um, we go in, we assess kind of how they do business. I always find salespeople, this seems to be common no matter where. If you just put me in front of more of the right buyers, I, I can get the job done. And then I, then I go back and I said, well, one of your KPIs, your key performance indicator, says that you have to get the appointment. I understand that most of us could sell more easily if we're just put in front of a buyer, unfortunately, though, one of your KPIs is you have to get that appointment. I don't think it's a, I, I think it's a combination of a couple of things. I really do. Uh, I think as you get more mature as a salesperson like you or I, we want to do less of the, we want to do less of the hard work and more of the sexy things, right? So you you got, when you salespeople get mature, they, they've been there, done that. I don't necessarily want to work that hard, Right. Two, I think we've looked in Medusa's eyes where we've heard, you know, that cold calling is dead, that old school prospecting is dead, and we actually have bought it. But I have not really seen that it is. Like as much as I hear it sold to me, I would say 90% of the business issues that we deal with have to do with winning appointments. I was on the phone today with the New York Yankees, their customer with um the Detroit Tigers and the Red Wings, who were part of one sports group. And I would say at least 20% of our conversation with their sales leaders was about winning appointments. And you would think a uh, large pro sports business, business to business salespeople would have some kind of technology to win appointments B2B. And you know what? They struggle as much as anybody else. My people struggle with that. So I, I think it's a, it's it's lazy, it's a misconception. It's um, maybe some of the KPIs that we're holding our salespeople to, right? But they don't they don't understand that. Uh, and I think the last thing is, and I think this is the most important because I think the question is very loaded, but it's a great question. I don't think salespeople understand the numbers of what it takes. It, it's not impossible. Look, the phone's not dead. It's harder. Um, Email is still a way to communicate to people. Then you have all kinds of social media that are that, you know, some people get caught up. Should I should I be messaging that way? Um, my, our, our advice is always if it's not illegal, immoral or unethical, everything's on the table. So um, your approach would be in most organizations this to, to win an appointment with an executive it probably takes six to eight touches or more just to have a conversation. Then you got to count how many converse, conversations win an appointment, right? And that probably takes another six to eight of those contacts to an appointment. I think a lot of people don't understand the ratios. And the ratios haven't gone up and it's gotten harder. So not impossible, harder. So the most we find most organizations don't understand how many touches it takes to be successful. Final question on this, Lance. Do we need to reframe this as rather than we need to make eight touches and then we we hit the jackpot, we get the phone call, and then we're in our element and we can get a deal done? Would a would a more healthy way to be to look at it from our conversation today and what I'm I'm pulling from you here, would it be that that is eight opportunities to increase our credibility so that when we actually get the person on the phone, everything runs smoother and we've actually made our lives easier? Would that be a better mindset to have with some of this? Yeah, you'd be so surprised. That's so well said. When we when we do analysis or we watch or observe, I think most salespeople, because the ratios, the hit ratios are so many, like you have to go through so many things just to have a conversation with people. When they're when they when, when somebody picks up the phone or engages you, I'm just so blown away about 
most salespeople don't know what to say or how to say it. So they open up with the, or they misconstrue what they're trying to do, right? Um, I, do, I know one thing to be true, rings and watches are very expensive pieces of jewelry. And um, probably some of the most expensive pieces of jewelry are most valued. And I think salespeople are so caught up with the word relationship that they're trying to build all this rapport with somebody over the phone or in their quick engagement, they don't realize they're destroying credibility because they're wasting somebody's time. And I think sometimes salespeople misconstrue really good people skills or good manners for somebody being interested in you. So they don't know what to say. They appear they're wasting somebody's time. They're not catching people's attention. You know, that first seven seconds is critical. I don't care where you are in the world. That seven seconds to 21 seconds, what you're going to say next is critical. 21 seconds to a minute. And you got to know what you're trying to accomplish when you engage somebody. And it's not selling the whole thing. It's trying to win time and awareness from them. And, and that that's that's important. Not everybody's good at that. For sure. And the best analogy I have of this is, because I, I, I think I'm reading you right in that you don't think relationships are as important as credibility and relationships selling and all this kind of stuff is, is a, a way to market books. Um, so you can tell me if you if you if I'm on the right tracks of that. But the way I use as an analogy to understand this is that if Warren Buffett rung me and said he's got a deal for me, I'm going to answer the phone and probably take whatever deal he's offering me because he's got that massive amount of credibility. I've never spoke to Warren Buffett before. He doesn't know who I am. Doesn't know I exist. So if you can clearly, most salespeople are not going to get to that level of of uh, investment advice and and credibility in the marketplace, but you want to head towards that, right? And that's that that eliminates this pressure for relationships and, and faffing around on the phone trying to get someone to like you. No, no doubt. And I think what people misconstrue, relationships are outcomes to something. You don't start with relationship. You, you establish credibility. You build rapport. You show a level of understanding. And, and you're going to take the call from Warren Buffett based on his credibility, not the rapport you have with him. So it's it's that triangle that that does it. One's not more important than the other. They're each equal lateral. And you got to know what you're doing at the time. So especially making cold calls, especially if you go back to that spider webbing concept we started off with, spider webbing is about credibility because you're demonstrating to the buyers that you understand their organization. That's really what spider webbing is about. So. What a pro, We're bringing it back to uh, wrapping it up in a nice little bow like that, lads. I appreciate it, mate. Right, I've got one final question to ask everyone that comes on the show, so we'll, we'll wrap up with this. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? That if you take care of the little things, the big things take care of themselves. My dad said, what you lose in the bananas, you make up in the grapes. I think that means the same thing. I think too many times as my younger self, um, I wasn't focused on little things. Just even, I remember the biggest mistake I ever made in sales is I was selling to a guy and his name was Billy. I had a great meeting with him. Then I met with him and his boss on my formal proposal. I put William. He opened up the meet, the next meeting and said, hey, just wanted you to know first, before we start, my name is Billy and it's a family name. And that's really important to me. I can tell you that that would have been the biggest sale I ever had at that point, but it went sideways from there because I didn't take care of little things. Mm. It's profound advice. I appreciate that, Lance. Well, with that, mate, tell us where we can find out more about you. Mention the book as well. And uh, anything else you want to share to Sales Nation? I appreciate that. Um, uh, the title of the book is Selling is an Away Game. You can find it on Amazon, Lance Tice, at Lance Tyson on Twitter. You can connect with me at LinkedIn. Uh, uh, Lance Tyson um, and uh, or www.tysongroup.com. I appreciate it. Good stuff. You're welcome, mate. I will link to all of that in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.org. And with that, Lance, I appreciate your insights on this. I really enjoyed the conversation. I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you.